So um, today I want to continue some conversation I guess we've been having all week about inaccurate data and fanning the flames. We have bad tests. We have the health director and this governor lie to us about data here and everywhere it's going on. So um, we're going to have some more of this. It, it just becomes more and more egregious and I think the reason why the lying becomes more and more egregious is because the, the population's kind of over it. Uh, people are starting to congregate and um, uh, I'm getting wonderful uh, encouraging emails from people who are saying we went back to church in a state where everything's supposed to be locked down there were 300 of us there we sang um, we had communion in a Catholic church and I love hearing about that that's what should be going on in the United States go outside take off that stupid mask hug your friends go back to normal life this is ridiculous anyway so here's some examples of the ridiculousness, all right? I'm sure by now you've heard the news. There's, it's on every day, they're bombarding the airwaves with it. There's another outbreak of COVID-19 in China. This is huge. Soon there are gonna be major shutdowns. Probably the same thing is gonna happen here. We have to be careful. It's starting again, shut down the airlines. Nobody should leave their house. Oh my gosh, things must stop right now. All right, so let's look at the data, all right? Now understand that in China, there's a great, they're looking for any excuse to control people. That's what communist regimes do. Now we happen to be living under a company, I think it's a hybrid here in the United States, a little bit of communism, a little bit of Nazism. I think some of the health uh, department folks and some of the governors would have fit in with Hitler's uh, folks really, really well. I mean, I, they, they really miss their calling. It's too bad they weren't around then. But in any case, the outbreak in Beijing, which caused one city official to say that the entire city is now in wartime mode, wartime, all right? On June 14th, there were 36 new cases of COVID-19 in Beijing, 36. This was updated to 79 infected and seven more asymptomatic carriers. And so there was a huge fuss over this that when they redid the data, they discovered it was twice as many as reported because we thought there were 36 and there were actually 79. Oh my gosh. All right, now there are 25.41 million people in Beijing. So you can see how 79 cases, mostly asymptomatic would be a cause for panic. I mean, I just don't know how you can let that go not addressed, right? There's more. On June 15th, there were three confirmed cases in Hubei province and one asymptomatic carrier for a total of four, and the population of Hubei is 58.5 million people. Now, when you've got four people out of 58.5 million who have the flu, I mean, I, I just don't know why. You could not take drastic enough action. I mean, you probably ought to kill the four who have it just to get them out of the way and lock everybody down for, I don't know, maybe two or three years, wait for it to pass. Zhu Jing, a government official in Beijing, says, quote, the containment efforts have rapidly entered a wartime mode and 100,000 workers had entered the battlefield. Now, this seems logical to me. There are 83 new cases in China and 100,000 workers sent in to address this. It's 1,266 people per infected person who are being sent in. Good job. And they're on the case with 83, uh, we have 83 cases in population total of 83 million people. And the schools are closing, sports events are canceling, and the temperature checks are back on. So um, really, I mean, the sheeples out there must be just cheering for the Chinese because look at how proactive they are, all right? When you have 83 people, out of 83 million with the flu, you send in 100,000 workers and you go into wartime mode. Okay, well, I wish I could tell you that China's the only place that's happening. Inflated deaths in nursing homes is becoming a problem as the data are being published and the people who run the nursing homes are saying, I'm looking at that and I have no idea where they got these numbers because I work there, I reported the data and that's not it. So the CDC data, this starts with a nursing home in New Jersey that CDC said had 753 deaths, the highest in the nation. But the nursing home says there were only 20 all over the country where the same thing is being reported. And one researcher said that they've blown up the numbers so many times that the actual death rate between the forged death certificates and everything else may be between three and 10,000, not a hundred and some thousand, okay? So this is the extent to which false data has been given to the public on a regular basis. 
So I'll just give you some examples. They're very specific and there are names and places involved. Josephine Ajaya, administrator at the Saugus Rehab and Nursing Center in Saugus, Massachusetts, found out that a new Medicare website reported that her facility had 794 confirmed cases of COVID-19, second highest in the country, and 281 staff infections. Those weren't the numbers her facility reported to CDC. Here's what she reported. It's an 80-bed facility. There were 45 who tested positive, five died. The CMS website showed no deaths, but instead of 794, there were 45, and there were 19 staff infections instead of 281. So you just wonder, I mean, how stupid is the CDC? Well, I mean, really, they're not the stupid ones. They know what they're doing. They know that sheep out there will hear this and not check it out. And even though I'm telling you that this is going on, there will be people who email me uh, later today and say, you're lying about those numbers. The CDC knows what they're doing and they never lie to us. So why do you get on the air every week and tell people these false stories, Pam? It's really disturbing me. All right, well, anyway, that's not the only one. Um, officials at other skilled nursing homes have basically reported the thing, same thing. Um, the numbers, many of the uh, heads of the nursing homes are very upset about this, first of all, because it makes, it makes it look terrible. I mean, the families are scared, they're looking at these data, they're calling and they're concerned about their loved ones, particularly since in most cases they're not allowed to see them. You know, we used to count on families having access to people in hospitals and nursing homes. That's how they got good care. Most of the people I know who've had family members in nursing homes, it was their constantly being there that made sure that their, their mom or dad or grandma, whoever it was, was getting the right kind of care. That's not allowed anymore, okay? Well, here's another example. Southern Point Living Center in Colbert, Oklahoma has 95 beds. It was reported to have had 339 residents die of COVID-19, but the facility had no cases, not even suspected cases. So 339 people died of COVID-19 in spite of the fact that nobody had it. Well, that's interesting. Um, so the day after the CMS released the data, uh, the, somebody from the facility called uh, to complain. And, you know, they're concerned about their family members. This sounds pretty serious, right? Um, Del, Del Ridge Health and Rehabilitation Center in Paramus, New Jersey, CMS data indicated it had the most of any nursing home in the country at 753. The uh, marketing director wrote in a frantic email, insanely wrong was what he called it. We're a 90 bed center and have had less than 20 deaths. How do you report 753 instead of 20? Okay. Paula Sanders, an attorney in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, who represents 200 skilled nursing facilities, said many of her clients can't figure out where these numbers are coming from. It's destroying the trust between the facilities and the families because the families have felt like somebody's lying to them. Obviously, they're concerned if those if this nursing homes are a cesspool of COVID-19 and deaths, you'd certainly be concerned for your family member, but they're absolutely lying about it, okay? And why would you do that? if not to just gin up fear and panic and, you know. And here's another thing. This is, this is another very interesting perspective. So I get these emails from people who go, what do you think about the outbreak in Arizona? The cases are going up. Well, I don't know. What do you think about more cases of the flu? Okay, it's the flu, people. Well, here's how they do it. An article in the Arizona Republic on Wednesday, June 10th, experts said Arizona's COVID-19 spread is alarming and action is needed. Yahoo News reported a spike in cases in all southwestern states. It's scary. The more lockdowns and more rules you can, you know, if you get everybody all scared. So, so what the media report is, it's, there are spikes in cases. It's dangerous. You should not go outside ever again, right? Well, here's what's really going on in Arizona. I looked into it because people write to me and they say, well, how do you explain this? I mean, you know, I can't go outside in Arizona. Well, here's what's going on. More cases are being diagnosed because more people, first of all, more people are getting tested. But another thing that's going on is people are showing up for healthcare services that were delayed because nothing happened. You couldn't even get cancer treatment in some areas. So all these people now are showing up for treatment and they're getting tested as a requirement for care. Thousands of asymptomatic people are, tested, are testing positive. We'll ignore the fact that the tests are inaccurate just for a moment, but you've got people showing up because it's time to have their knee replaced. They test positive for COVID-19. 
The asymptomatic people become cases and letting people go outside is cited as the reason for the cases of people who aren't sick with the flu. And then thousands of people who aren't sick with the flu are reasons to go back to being locked down again. Now, did you get that? Because that's what those sheeples are thinking that we ought to be doing. If you ignore the smoke and mirrors and you check out the real data with the Arizona Department of Health Services, which I know is a, you know, just a strange and unusual thing to do. I don't know why anybody would check that out instead of just believing what Yahoo says. I mean, but I'm one of those crazy people who does, right? It's not nearly as scary. In fact, it's not scary at all. There was one new admission for COVID-19, COVID on June 10th, one. So how does the media report that hospitalizations of COVID patients are up? The cases are up and so are the hospitalizations by reporting everyone who's in the hospital who tests positive as a case, having your knee replaced and you tested positive, you're a COVID patient. Um, getting a stent replaced and you tested positive, you're a COVID patient. It's just like if you got hit by a bus and you tested positive after you died from the trauma, you died of COVID, right? You can create a whole new pandemic and a whole reason to lock and a whole new reason to lock people up for longer and longer periods of time with this. I mean, it's just, you know, you can demand the mask wearing. You see how dangerous things are? We had one, the real data are, think about if they actually told the truth. One person was admitted to the hospital for COVID on June 10th. Stay inside, wear masks, you can't go outside. Stay six feet away. Children have to wear helmets to school. They got to sit six feet apart. Maybe we won't have school. We certainly can't have concerts, no arts. I mean, they could, they could never get away with it unless they falsify the numbers and that's how they do it. And this, again, this constant focus on cases, makes me nuts. I mean, how many times can you listen to people talk about 700 people have the flu in the southwest part of the United States and believe we've got a problem? And then this is a classic. Um, this, uh, this has to do with a child whose story was covered in People magazine. And the headline was, perfectly healthy 16-year-old who loved photography and video games died suddenly from COVID-19. Now, the first thing I want to say is anytime anybody dies, I'm upset about it. Anytime a child dies, I'm more upset about it, okay? Um, and, and so what I'm gonna talk about here has nothing to do with the fact that a family lost a child, and this is horrible, and I feel terrible for them. What I think is worse is when criminals with an agenda politicize it and blow it out of proportion to suit their purposes, and that's what happened here. The 16-year-old who's the subject of the article is Andre Guest. His mother, Dawn Guest, is a nurse in, an Indi in Indianapolis who told the reporter that her son was, quote, perfectly healthy in the morning and within 24 hours is fighting for his life. But that's actually not what happened. A picture of Andre shows that he was obese. Perfectly healthy adolescents are not obese. The article also states that prior to being adopted by Dawn and her husband, Andre and his twin sister, were born prematurely at 25 weeks, and they spent months in the hospital before they were brought home. He was diagnosed subsequently with autism. The article describes the extra measures the family went to to take care of, you know, to try to mitigate the risks since Dawn was a healthcare worker. After each shift, she'd take off her shoes at the door where her husband would disinfect them, and then she'd head upstairs immediately to shower. The family cleaned surfaces with disinfectant wipes and they wore masks when they had to leave the house and practice social distancing. Andre was the only family member who never left the house at all. So we already know from data in New York that's dangerous to stay home, but that's what Andre did. On the day that this happened, Andre was slurring his speech and then he fell down and by the time his mother got home, he'd lost the ability to stand up. His head and eyes were rolling. He couldn't grip anything. Um, so they, she called an ambulance, they took him to the nearest emergency room and transferred him to the Riley Hospital for Children. The article states that Andre had no underlying medical conditions, but he was in fact an undiagnosed uh, type 1 diabetic. His blood sugar was a dangerous 1500 milligrams per deciliter. Because he had a fever and a cough and breathing hard, he was tested for COVID, but he actually tested negative. But they continued to test until he tested positive, which is that's what we do that all the time. Um, Johnny and Andre's uh, two sisters were, um, uh, Johnny the father, and the two sisters were swabbed and they too were positive, although they only had mild fevers and fatigue. Don, who was um, at the hospital with Andre, decided not to get tested because according to the policies of the hospital, she wouldn't be allowed back in if she was positive. So I think it's not notable that the healthcare worker didn't do what she was supposed to do because she understood that that would cause her to not have access to her son. 
Well, things progressed and the poor child ended up on a ventilator and eventually died. And once again, I want to say, I'm terribly sorry for this family. It's a horrible, horrible loss. But this child was vulnerable due to his obesity, due to the way he started life. He was autistic. Children who are autistic are notorious for having severe, sometimes gastrointestinal problems. We don't know what other health issues he had associated with that. And he was a type one diabetic. And as I said, this is incredibly tragic. But what's more tragic is the fact that it was used in this terrible way by criminals who really don't care about anybody except furthering their agenda. So my heart goes out to the family who lost their child. I'm sorry for your loss, and I'm sorry that your family has been exploited in this terrible, terrible way. All right, that's all for today. Um, Pam Popper at MSN.